morning. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here back in Berlin. Uh, what I wanted to do today is actually share with you some of the work we're doing at the interface between design, technologies, and the city. Um, the first picture I wanted to start with is um, the following one. You know, this is something people used to be really fascinated in the 1990s, thinking about a world that would become increasingly virtual. So virtual that many people at the time, uh, including Gilder, as in this quote, thought that actually physical space would be less and less important. So Gilder in 95 thought the cities themselves would almost disappear. We are headed for the death of cities, he wrote. Well, what does it teach you? The first thing it teaches you is, you know, never predict the future. Um, you know, no prediction could have been more wrong than this one. Uh, we know the cities have been thriving over the past few years. This is a picture from China. China this century will probably build more urban fabric than all of humanity ever built. We know that since 2008, half of the world's population lives in cities, and that number actually could uh, swell to 5 billion by 2030. So what has happened, really, is that digital hasn't killed physical space, hasn't reduced the need of physical space, but something new is happening. The basically digital and physical are recombining. It's like the words of bits and atoms with us in the middle. And, you know, and that opens up very exciting possibilities when we think about cities and when we think at all the objects that are in them, so designing all of them. I very much like this quote by Mike Weiser, who was one of the pioneers at Xerox Park a few decades ago. Uh, and, you know, he started by saying the first era was about mainframe computers. And then we got to personal computers. And then, you know, now is ubiquitous computing, where computing is really everywhere. And in a certain sense, he said, you know, the age of calm technology, where technology recedes into the background of our lives. And uh, as I was saying, this opens up many new possibilities. I wanted to mention just a couple of pictures here. This is something that's here at IFA. It's in the Vodafone space. Um, it's a, a thing uh, that, uh, that you can find. We designed in, uh, in our design office. Pietro, who's here, is, uh, was responsible for the project. It actually uh, is a little robot on the wall that actually uh, plots in, in real time on the wall what you show from selfies that you take uh, on the space. Uh, and you can find it here, just want to show this. But what I want to do is take actually one project in more detail, share with you, and uh, share with you actually how we think that uh, this um, is showing a new way that actually we design by bringing more disciplines together, and actually how we can go from a design to something built or to a product also is changing in a, in a radical way. So the thing started a few years ago when the mayor of Copenhagen uh, came to us at MIT uh, and said, you know, how could all of this actually help us with traffic in Copenhagen? Now, the amazing thing is that when you think about traffic in Copenhagen, it's not much about cars, but it's something like this. It's about a lot of bicycles. Copenhagen is a city where you had a lot of cars in the city center a few decades ago, but now it's a city where 30 to 50% of all trips every day actually happen by bicycle. So we started thinking about bicycles and we came up with, um, with the following idea. Welcome to the Copenhagen Wheel. The wheel that turns your ordinary bike into a smart electric hybrid. Quickly and easily with no additional batteries or wires. The Copenhagen Wheel allows you to capture the energy dissipated while braking and cycling. And save it for when you need a bit of a boost. Controlled through your smartphone, the Copenhagen Wheel becomes a natural extension of your everyday life. The Copenhagen Wheel is your personal trainer, sensing your effort level and providing you with real-time feedback about your fitness and exercise goals. The Copenhagen Wheel also enhances your experience of the city. It connects you with things a cyclist wants to know. Upcoming traffic congestion, road conditions and pollution levels. Choose to keep your data or share it with your friends and other cyclists through social networks like Facebook. As you ride, you also collect green miles. It's similar to a frequent flyer program, but good for the environment. Elegant, responsive, smart. A new mode of transport for a rapidly changing world. So turn on your life and turn on the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. So um, this was the initial concept, and uh, what I want to do is go with you through the different stages of design. When you look at combining bits and atoms, actually the people you need 
to bring around the drawing tables are actually different than what you would have done just a few years ago. So everything started actually with a workshop at MIT with a number of students, and different ideas came up about cycling, including this kind of funny-looking wheel you see at the bottom. And at the beginning, it was really nothing more than a funny-looking wheel. There was not much thinking about it, but the idea that actually this thing could perhaps get your energy, you know, not, not thinking at all technically, but get your energy and give it back to you when, when you needed it. Um, so, you know, the student work workshop finished, and then, you know, then we had actually to propose something to the city of Copenhagen. And usually, you know, if in doubt, let's try it out. So let's try actually to do a prototype to see if this could work. Some of the first sketches, you know, we started putting together some batteries and the motor, uh, combining them together. It looked pretty ugly at the beginning. Um, but, you know, but it was the first prototype, and uh, we went to Copenhagen, showed it to the mayor. It was actually working. She liked it. That's in the main square of Copenhagen. So then at that point, we went back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board, so we tried to define better the, uh, the brief, what we were trying to do. So something can be easily retrofitted, regenerative braking, intelligent locking, so the bike will find out if it's you who's actually there using it. Um, if somebody else you know, will just charge your batteries and then you know, you'll find it still. Uh, electric motors, sensors, and uh, fitness, like the bike becomes like your personal trainer. Uh, so again, you know, back to the drawing board, putting all the pieces together, rethinking how to get, put the motor together, the different sensors inside, the torque. So actually the torque makes uh, the bike something that will respond based on the torque you apply. The motor will multiply it. So it's like having somebody cycling with you, just multiplying your torque by one, two, or three, or ten. And, uh, you know, that was the inside, and uh, here we had uh, traditional designers and mechanical engineers really working together. And then um, we actually had to connect to, uh, to the rim. So this was the first prototype, again, very ugly. Um, this, we tried this, actually it looked a bit better, but um, didn't work. If you think about it, the torque doesn't uh, distribute from the center to the rim. Um, and then we th thought about this option, which is actually little spokes, they simply touch the hub, and then curve and go back to, to the rim. But without actually being fixed to the hub, just you know, touching it and, uh, uh, and, uh, and going back. And you know, some of us thought it would work, some of us thought it wouldn't work. Again, uh, if in doubt, let's uh, try it out. That was the first uh, prototype. Um, another one made with 3D printing. Again, you know, all of this has been, become much, much faster uh, thanks to 3D printing. You can just take an idea, print it, and you know, see if this uh, works or not. That wasn't the case just a few years ago. Just 10 years ago, the 3D printers, you could use them to make powder models. They were interesting to look at the shape, but not really interesting to, to put on a bicycle. Now you can take this and actually put it and make a, you know, make it, make it, make it 3D print uh, of plastic or resin or of metal, so it's something we can really use as an object. Um, and, uh, you know, put the spokes. Uh, he was very skeptical, as you see. But then actually this, uh, this was working, so this was the way to connect the hub with, uh, with the rim outside. And uh, then we had to actually do all the controls. How actually do we control the wheel uh, from the phone? So without creating a new interface, how this where actually interaction designers in the lab came to play. Uh, something very simple, it would allow you to select how much torque more, you want, how much torque you want to supplement to the one you actually produce yourself. And then, you know, many other things about uh, how you navigate and how you move inside the city. Now, as I said before, we also wanted to make this a bit different and actually get those information about the city that are relevant for cyclists. Think about air quality. It's very, very important if you want to decide where you're going to cycle every day. And, you know, people do that uh, today. There's a number of people who've been using sensing on bicycles. Um, you know, this is not a joke. These are some projects actually out there. But we actually didn't want to go this way, so we wanted to try something, something else. You see here something very, very small. We got uh, existing sensors, but we wanted to integrate them in, uh, inside the wheel. And when you integrate them, you can get uh, different measurements. It's quite interesting because today, in a city such as Berlin, you only have a few measurement stations in the city. It tells you very little about your personal exposure. But if you do this, you actually get the sensors next to you, so you can bas basically measure people's exposure, which is uh, what is really the main determinant of health. Uh, and if you see here in the little video, just if you take just a few bicycles and let them run through Copenhagen, after a, a while you get, uh, you cover the whole city very, very quickly. This is a very small fleet. You see the star moving, it's around 10 bicycles. And, um, and you see the major information, the shared information, and then you cover very quickly the city with fine-grained resolution about, uh, about air quality. This is NOx, but you can have a PM10, so particular matter. You can take CO, CO2, NOx, and so on. 
So, um, well, you know, that was uh, uh, putting everything together. Then we had to ship it to Copenhagen for a, for a big summit that the mayor, where the mayor wanted to present it. Uh, President Obama and the other people were, were there. Uh, so we had to produce a number of them, uh, you know, program all the different pieces. That's where actually electrical engineers and programmers came, came in in order to combine everything. And um, here, shipping to Copenhagen. Uh, that was the, the presentation. Here was actually the first uh, trial of the wheel uh, by the mayor of Copenhagen and the mayor of Toronto at the time. Run away, run away, run away. Oh, I felt it. is fantastic. It's incredible. It takes no effort. You see my bike? You start pedaling and the motor takes over. And then it, it will tell you the air quality, te temperature. And so, in the, um, in the next few minutes, what I wanted to, to share with you is the first thing is actually how when you play really at the, at the intersection of digital and physical bits and atoms, you really, the way you design is much more collaborative and with people coming from many more disciplines. All the way, you know, if you look at this space that people sometimes call the smart city, it's about the city, so you want the disciplines of design, of architecture, of planning. It's about technology, so you want uh, engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, other types of engineers, even mathematics and physics. And then, of course, it's about people. It's about how we live in cities, so you want all the social sciences or interaction design, or actually all the disciplines that look at, uh, at the interaction with, uh, with, with us, with humans, because that's, uh, that's the ultimate goal. So that was the first thing I want to share with you about this, about the process of design. But the other thing is actually how easily then this can be developed in a, in a different way. As you know, you're familiar, you can put something just in a on Kickstarter and you use it in order to go from a prototype to something you can sell. In this case, it was a similar thing. It actually, <clears throat> the idea um, got uh, venture capital funds and now is a, is a startup uh, in uh, Cambridge in, uh, next to MIT called Super Pedestrian. It looks at the wheel, but the more in general of how to make each of us almost like a super pedestrian or somebody who in the city can actually experience human power mobility in a, in a different way. Uh, this is actually the final product. Between the two, there's a few years. Uh, so I hadn't shown this project for a while because it's, uh, it started a bit of time ago, um, but now this is the last video from a few months ago, which is the one that's uh, for sale now. This is the Copenhagen Wheel. It turns your ordinary bicycle into a smart electric hybrid by simply replacing your back wheel. Connect it to your smartphone, download the app, and you're ready to go. Bicycles are a great way to move around, yet sometimes distances are too long, hills can get in the way, and hard journeys to work may leave you covered in sweat. The Copenhagen Wheel is here to change all of that. The technology was developed over several years at MIT together with the city of Copenhagen, one of the world's most innovative places for cycling. Its original inventors licensed the technology and founded Super Pedestrian, the startup where we are now working around the clock to bring the wheel to you. Like the best riding companion, the Copenhagen Wheel learns how you pedal and integrates seamlessly with your motion. It captures your energy when you brake or go downhill and gives you a push when you need it with three to 10 times your regular foot power. It's easy, ride it just like a normal bike. As you pedal, the motor automatically kicks in with no additional throttles or buttons. All technology for the Copenhagen Wheel is contained within the red casing, including motor, removable batteries, wireless connectivity, smart locking, multiple sensors, and an embedded control system. Use your smartphone to customize your ride, monitor your physical activity, gather information from your environment to share with your friends and fellow cyclists. And if you're a software developer, 
You can even create your own biking apps. So whether you carry yourself, your kids, or your gear, hills seem flat, distances shrink, and you can cycle just about anywhere. So transform your bike and transform the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. So I'll uh, finish here, but what I want to say is really uh, how this and this new space that we are talking about today, about the convergence of you know, technology in the city, about uh, ubiquitous computing, as my, Mark Weiser was saying, is changing really the way we design, but also the way we can go from a design, from an idea to a prototype, and then all the way to something that can be out there uh, in the world in a way that was very different just, uh, just a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Carlo. Thank you. Grazie.